Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to this, uh, for me, very amazing event to have four really esteemed members of the political and social cartooning establishment here at SPX all at the same time. We're going to do insiders and outsiders, perspectives on political and social commentary. Uh, and um, everybody, we're going to have everybody introduce themselves, and we're going to show a little bit of their works, and we're going to start off with Allie. Okay. <laughs> Where is it? There we go. Oh, it's the down arrow. Okay. <laughs> Who did that? Oh, so this is not working? There we go. It's very directional. Yeah. Okay. I got it. All right. Uh, Allie. Okay. Well, I'll, st I'll introduce myself if that picks you up. Okay. Uh, so I'm Allie Schwed. Um, I am. Now I'm going to time everybody for about five, six minutes. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Cut me off when you need to. <laughs> so uh, I'm based out of New Jersey right now. I've been working in comics for quite a few years at this point. Um, so most of the work that I, pretty much all the work that I do circles around journalism, nonfiction work. The last two books that I put out, one was about the Constitution, one was about democracy and forms of government. And I do a lot of work for the website, The Nib, which I think a lot of us up here do. Uh, this piece that's on the screen right now, this is a piece I did for Vox about school lunches and just talking about the, the history of school lunches. So I have a range of topics that I kind of cover a lot of work on gender studies and um, gender rights and reproductive rights. Uh, let's see what else is coming up on the screen. Uh, Vox School Lunches. <laughs> That's also from the same one. Let me see. This is not good. So this was a piece that I did for the Nib. Um, and going with the, the topic of today, the kind of specifics of like being an insider and outsider and the things that we're, we're talking about and writing about, uh, the Nib has a piece that they call the, the response that they ask for very first person, first hand accounts on a given topic. And this one I did on a piece for a while I was living in Mexico, uh, but I'm born and raised from New Jersey. And it was kind of at the time of the Trump administration coming into power. And it was a very odd time to be an expat living in another country. And I was still able to vote and be connected to a certain extent. But there was this weird sense of not being home and not being able to like be in the country that I call my home when all of this change is happening in the country. So that was the piece that I did, very much being an insider piece and me talking about my personal experiences within the larger sociopolitical context of this administration change. Uh, this is another one from the same, the response that was specifically about the massive amount of student debt that I have, student loan debt. Um, so another very insider piece of me talking about my personal experiences. But then a lot, I would say the majority of the work that I do, though, is me more so reporting on topics that I'm not necessarily in the middle of or that are, are happening to me or that I'm reporting from like an outsider perspective. So I think that kind of sets up the, the framework for this. Um, this panel pretty well. Uh, so this is a good example of that. This was a piece that I did for the Nib magazine. All of these are Nib pieces. Um, that their magazine, if anybody's familiar with the Nib magazine, every issue has a larger, broad theme. And the theme of this issue was secrets. So with my partner, Gerardo Alba, and I, we did a piece on cover-up tattoos, specifically cover-up tattoos of gang tattoos or racist tattoos that there's kind of in the tattoo community, there's a lot of tattoo artists who offer to do cover-ups of these tattoos for free. So we did a piece on the artists who are offering. Wasn't this these. from a longer piece though? Was it just? It wasn't from a longer piece, but we're working on a longer oh, okay. piece of it. So it started off as the short form and we're, we're working on something longer. Come on. Now we go. Oh, I guess if you have anything more to say, you still have to No, that's, the, that's fine. Let's pass it off to Ruben. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ruben Bowling. I do a uh, comic strip called Tom the Dancing Bug that I've done for 32 years. 
Um, started in newspapers and now it's mostly on the web, um, but still in newspapers. Um, and, uh, you know, I came to political cartooning, uh, to the extent that I am a political cartoonist, through uh, sort of general humor newspaper cartooning. I was originally in a lot of alternative news weeklies, but I would do very silly general humor stuff, sometimes political stuff. The way I started my comic strip, I always thought that like, my, my mandate to myself was that it was going to be like Mad Magazine, but I'm the entire gang of idiots. I would do different, <laughs> different you know, styles and formats, and I would, do, you know, I would do everything. And kind of like Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, where it's like a sketch comedy. You can see, I'm not going to read these, but you can see that um, you know, it's, a, it's like a sketch. It's a little story, uh, and, it's, and it's satire. And so it's like SNL in that it's, um, you know, any week it could be a recurring character like this one, Godman. It could be a brand new thing that might become a recurring character or not. And it, sometimes it could be political. Um, okay, you could, you could switch to the next one. So what happened was as I, you know, as things changed, 9-11 um, happened. Um, I got older. I got more interested in politics. I just, it just began to seep into my comic strip more and more. And it went from like 10% to 20 to 30%. Certainly 9-11 was a big change. This one is from 2002, and I'm still using that, you know, the sketch comedy format, but now I'm, it's more sort of pointedly political. This one is about um, Lucky Ducky, who, this is the first one, and he became a recurring character. Uh, he's a, um, a duck who, uh, his nemesis is Hollingsworth Hound, who's a rich dog. And, uh, you know, I'm look, it's, it looks like a funny animal cartoon, but I'm making, you know, comments about uh, regressive income tax and things like that. Uh, so I have a lot of fun, fun with that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, my, my goal was always to, even when I became political, was always to be entertaining and funny. And politics became just another way that I could try to be entertaining and funny. Um, it's not, I didn't want to, I didn't set out to become a political cartoonist, it's just like, I, every week I have to do something, and so politics, I got more interested in it, and it became a way to do that. A huge turning point in the strip was uh, 2016, uh, the rise of Donald Trump, um, and during his campaign, I, which I thought, you know, I, I said, this is the most important political phenomenon of my lifetime. I'm going to devote the comic strip to Donald Trump for the next year until the campaign, until the election. Um, so this is an example. I'm still doing like parodies and satire, but it's about this one is Donald and John drawn like Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, Donald Trump, um, before he became a candidate, used to act as his own publicist and make up a name and call up reporters and talk about Donald Trump. So I thought, well, he has an imaginary publicist that's like Calvin and Hobbes. So I have little, little Donald and, and John Barron, and that's, this also became a recurring um, a recurring comic. So, um, so that became that became very political then, and this is one that I did fairly recently um, after the, the tragic school shooting. And one of the hardest things I've I've ever had to draw. Um, this was a very emotional one for me, but you know I included it to show that you know I'm I'm sort of it's it's whatever I can do that week. Um, so this is not aimed to be funny or really to entertain. It was more uh, cathartic. Uh, I, I had to express something about what had happened. Um, so I drew, um, somehow, I found my, got myself to draw the inside of a, of a school classroom in the style of Richard Scarry, sort of juxtaposing the, the, the innocent, um, you know, cute um, style of Richard Scarry with the, the very dark times that, that we're living in. Um, and then the next one is uh, just uh, an even more recent one. This one's about the, uh, the, the document, the Trump taking the documents. Uh, and, um, you know, this was, uh, you know, this one is, is very pointed. Um, I sort of drew this one because I didn't feel as though the mainstream media um, was talking enough about I, what I think is the very obvious reason why he took the documents, which is to sell them. Uh, they, they, me, media seems to all, only talk about, well, he's being careless with documents and, and it's in an insecure place. And it seems to me 
you know, this is definitely the reason why I did it. And I, and I wanted to draw that. So, and and this, so I included this one sort of the show, like this is sort of what I don't want to do, which is try to, um, you know, make a point and try to, I can't change anybody's mind. That, I don't, in 32 years, I don't think I've changed a single mind. Um, if I've had any impact, as minuscule as it could be, it could be maybe you know comforting people who have who have similar views to, to me, and often <laughs> we're we're in the minority, um, and we have been certainly many times. Uh, so so offering comfort to uh, to to us is sort of what I want to do. But this one sort of I, I like the comic; it worked out well. But it sort of it goes against my mission. It's like I was trying to to add a voice to the conversation, um, and my voice is so small, and it's not really what I try to do. So. Um, you know, that's that's basically it. I just try to um, comment on on the news and try to be funny. And you know, um, and sometimes it's not about the news. The next one may be about um, you know Frankenstein. <laughs> Come on. And that's it. It was working a second ago. Thank you, <laughs> Andy. Yes, I'm Andy Warner. Hi. Um, I, everything I do revolves around nonfiction comics in some way or another. Um, I teach nonfiction comics, I edit nonfiction comics, and I make nonfiction comics. Um, I have four books that have been published so far, uh, with another coming out next year. Again, all of them nonfiction. But the different kinds of nonfiction uh, really very pretty. Uh, broadly. So I work in journalism, um, I work in memoir, and I work in histories. Uh, three of my books are histories. Those are the rightmost one and then the bottom two. Um, stuff about utopias, things about the most interesting stories I could find and the most boring objects, and a kind of history and encyclopedia of all the animals that we love and all the animals that love us and how that great attachment has completely changed the world around us forever. Um, in all of my history work, I try to find kind of less trod paths, um, stranger stories, things that fascinate me, that hook me in a weird way. Um, and then I also work in memoir and, um, oh, oh, we can talk about the nib too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, go back one. Yeah, show the nib. Yes. Here we go. I'm there also an editor at the Nib. Um, I'm one of the contributing editors there, and I've been um, on their editorial board since the resurrection of the second form of the Nib. We are now in the third form of the Nib. The Nib is very resilient, um, like a cockroach. They keep trying to kill us, <laughs> and we keep somehow coming back. Um, but I've been making comics for them uh, since the first iteration um, with Medium, and. Uh, it's the, uh, Rubens being on this panel uh, with us is actually a really interesting link because Matt Bors, of course, started the Nib and he comes out of alternative um, alt weeklies and the Nib's DNA is really wrapped up um, in that, uh, that style as well as the kind of nonfiction journalism style. And so one of the things the Nib was really trying to do was marry those two um, tendencies in political comics in one place. Um, and I mainly work on the print issue. I used to work more on the website, but then there was a very dramatic defunding that happened a few years ago. Um, and so now um, I'm mainly focused on the print. It comes out quarterly and it's really fun. Um, the memoir that I did is called Spring Rain. Um, it came out right before the pandemic, like <laughs> a month before. Um, which saved me from having to go on book tour with it, which was actually, <laughs> honestly, kind of a relief um, because it's a very personal um, book. It's about uh, when I first moved to Beirut in 2005, uh, about three weeks after I moved there, the former prime minister, Rafi Kariri, was killed in a, a car bomb that blew up basically an entire city block. And then the country itself, Lebanon, was under political and military occupation by its neighbor, Syria, at the time sort of a hangover of the Civil War 15 years before. And this huge popular mobilization broke out, the Syrians were blamed for the assassination, and the government crumbled. It literally fell on the streets around me. And it, this marked me very profoundly. Um, I also, that was when I got introduced to the comic scene in Beirut, which I've remained very close to through um, the collective Samandal and just various artists that I know there. Um, and what the book kind of tries to end up being, uh, I went back in 2011 to work with this com comics collective, Samandal. So at that point, 
It was the summer of 2011, and the Arab uprisings were basically just kicking up. Um, and six years previously, there'd been this uprising in an Arab country. The government had been thrown off, and then the old systems had basically reasserted itself, and it fizzled out in this very heartbreaking way. Um, that sort of embittered everybody and broke the country in a lot of ways. Um, and it's, that book is about um, the, it's contrasting that as a harbinger to the later Arab uprisings. You can keep going, Warren. I think it's just more slides from that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it also um, delves into my own um, uh, kind of unstable mental landscape. I have a family history of bipolar disorder and have it myself on the sort of minor end of things. Um, and the cyclical nature of um, uprisings, the sort of emergent nature of it in almost any society. Emergence is an idea that like a structure will sort of emerge like ice crystallizing. Um, and uh, the emergence of revolution um, fascinated me because it was something that I experienced at the same time as I was sort of beginning to experience um, this wobbliness in my own brain. And the emergent structure of mental instability is something I used to compare and contrast with that. Um, in regards to my own person, um, I have a sort of interesting insider-outsider backstory because I um, was raised sort of as an American abroad in the colonies. Uh, my father is a marine biologist and we uh, followed his research onto various uh, small research labs which were often in beautiful tropical island paradises many of which the United States has colonized. So I grew up um, in St. Croix, which is a US colony, they still can't vote, um, in Panama, which we basically established the canal zone as, um, other places as well. But um, that perspective, I have the appearance of a white, cis, straight American, um, but I didn't really grow up here, and that kind of insider outsider has marked my life and a lot of my choices and where I choose to kind of move and tell my stories about. There we go. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sophia. Hello. This is so cool. Um, so I draw New Yorker cartoons. These are a few of them. They are not overtly political. Um, sometimes there are sort of broader political subjects that show up in them because New Yorker cartoons tend to sort of comment on either something going on in my life or in kind of the collective life. Um, I don't do a ton of political gag cartoons, um, though I love talking about them. I think I'm going to misattribute this, and maybe somebody remembers this quote and who it's from, but about political cartoons and how you afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, and those are sort of the two arenas they can fall into. Um, I don't know that I do either of those, but I like <laughs> thinking about it. Um, but I think more relevant to this panel is the other work that I do, so maybe you could flip. Um, I brought a prop, <laughs> it's a book. Um, oh, here's some, some there we go. cartoons. Um, yeah, so I, I just published this with Top Shelf. It came out in June and it's called Radical. Um, in 2018, I was living in North Brooklyn and there was this candidate running for state senate named Julia Salazar. She kind of looked like me, and we were the same age, and we like knew friends of friends, though I had never met her. And it was a moment where I was really uh, reckoning with my own political engagement, or lack thereof. I was sort of, uh, had responded strongly to the Trump presidency in 2017, but felt by this moment in 2018, towards the end of the year, like I had sort of lost the thread of this being like an, a sustained part of my life beyond like looking at headlines and feeling grim about it and like setting up a Planned Parenthood donation. It just didn't feel like I had meaningfully shifted anything really. So um, it was really a catalyst for me to see her campaign. It was so energized, um, really a ton of volunteers in the neighborhood, just very, very visible. So when she won her primary, I kind of on a whim sent an email to her team and I was like, I'm a cartoonist, I live here, can I follow you around? Um, and I was expecting this to be a more difficult endeavor to convince them to let me have creative ownership and to follow them through what I hoped would be basically every part of their experience of being democratic socialists in office for the first time, most of them. Um, 
but they pretty immediately gave me a carte blanche and invited me in. And so I spent the next year having known truly nothing about state politics prior to that point, uh, sitting in their office and going up to the Capitol. And because many of them came from an organizing background, it meant a lot of things like this. There was a big tenants' rights push in 2019. That was the main legislation that was going on. So um, the tenants' right organizers were very close to Julia and her office, so I spent a lot of time with them. Um, as far as the insider-outsider part, I mean, that's kind of the whole <laughs> book, um, is that I was physically inside. I was, I was invited into this space um, knowing really nothing. And so um, the book, for me, sort of served as a way to feel inside of this and as a kind of slow learner, <laughs> I felt like this was, this was maybe the most effective way that I could engage with this was to draw a comic about it um, and ideally have that comic by being narrative um, be something that people who like me maybe aren't interested in reading like textbooks about government um, could engage with and through it, through the story of these characters who are fascinating and flawed and truly all on the page, um, even in the moments of great stress and tension, um, all of it is in the book in a way that I hope tells the story of this year and, and piques interest, because that's certainly how I learn is through narrative format. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so um, I wanna kinda kick this off in, in this direction. We've, we've used these words insiders and outsiders. Now, now for me, uh, and by the way, full disclosure, I also have worked for the NIB a number of times. I do the archive section, and my focus is on the old-fashioned single-panel political cartoons, which in certain areas, except for, of course, the Pulitzer Prize, is now considered, you know, out of date. So one of my questions is, is what are we defining as insider versus outsider? I'm, I'm having a little problem because if, if you're talking about politics, I don't know about you, but I'm affected by anything that goes on within the fed in particular within the federal government and within elections and things like that. And so I'm not really an outsider because everything they do is affecting me. So I, I want to start the discussion about, well, what are we really talking about in terms of insider versus outsider? I'll start out with, um, we'll take Ali first. Okay. Well, as soon as you started saying that, and I think pretty much everybody here in their introduction kind of like had their like spark moment of what brought them into working on nonfiction cartoons. And I think Ruben, you mentioned it when you showed the Richard Scarry piece and you said like that was your way of dealing with the school shootings. And that was how I kind of got into it also. It was with the Pulse nightclub shooting. When that happened, I was also living in Mexico at the time and it was one of those moments that I was like, I, not that I could have done anything in New Jersey anyway, but I didn't know what to do. And the only thing I felt like I could do to cope and to just like kind of wrap my head around what was going on was to make a comic about it. So I did. And I think as you're saying this, Warren, like that automatically brought me into it because like I am now connecting with this, even though I wasn't there, I didn't know anybody who was involved, but like just hearing about it and knowing that it happened in like my home country when I was separated from it, this was my way of connecting with it by making this comic and trying to like work through it. That made me an insider. So I think it's not a black and white kind of idea. There's no binary there that it's like, if it's happening and it somehow affects you, makes you think about it, you're, you become an insider. Andy? Yeah. One, I guess a framework I would use to look at it um, is if we're um, if we're working in um, like so my work didn't used to be as political as it is now. Like when I started out uh, working for the NIB, it was kind of fun stories about science and things like that. A well, lot more. And and yeah. I would like to make, uh, make an observation about that. So I've heard the same thing from Ken. I've heard the sure. same thing yeah. from Durf Bacter, okay? <laughs> that originally, you know, it was more social commentary yeah. or some other topic or whatever it may be. But in a lot of cases, and Matt Boers was another one, 9-11 came along and these traumas seem to have come along to, and I'll Put, put it out there, radicalize everybody. Well, actually, one of my favorite questions that you can ask anybody is how were you radicalized? Because it, you can take it however you want, and it's the question that 
you know, authorities ask people that they believe are terrorists, right? right. If the FBI grabs you, it's the first thing they're going to ask. But you ha can decontextualize it and just ask that. Because like some people have radical politics within them often. They can kind of be buried or they can be more at the surface. Um, and so, I mean, the story of um, my drift into more explicitly political work, I don't know if it's all that interesting, right? Like the, that's kind of the story of America over the last few years. Um, but one thing that I think is interesting is just as a cartoonist working in nonfiction, um, a lot of us are sort of reflect reflexively acting as outsiders um, because it's sort of, you know, it's the art form, right? Um, yeah. And we, um, it's a medium that has always had to struggle a little bit. I mean, even like I remember I read your book before I came here and there's a moment where one of the guys was like, you're the anime uh, <laughs> person, or you're the, yeah, something like that. Um, and yeah, yeah that's. <laughs> the chief of staff, when he was introducing me to the, to the other staff, he referred to me as an anime narrator. <laughs> right. So like there's, you know, you were, we're trying um, with varying degrees of seriousness to make serious work. You know, it's about a very serious thing, whether we're being funny about it or not. But a lot of times people don't take us seriously because we draw comics. Um, and so that always, there's like a reflexive outsiderness to just being a cartoonist working at all, especially in nonfiction. But, but then again, if you went to a, um, any of Trump's rallies, you'd be one of them, okay? <laughs> right. Yeah, and yeah. so it's, it's, it's also a matter of perspective. Absolutely. All right. Hey, Ruben? Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I, I, I do think that there is, I guess, when you look at the four of us, I think I'm, I'm pretty different um, because uh, I don't work in nonfiction and I, and I, I don't I never inject myself into the, into the comics. I'm probably, I think I'm like the only cartoonist of my generation that I've never drawn myself in, uh, in, all, in all these years. So, you know, I sort of hide behind, you know, this, the, the satire and act as a, uh, you know, my goal is a, sort of as an outsider observer and commenter and that's sort of the you know and this and this is sort of you know we all have different goals every every artist has it has a different uh different goal and uh, why they got get into it um and you know cartooning is not a genre it's a it's a medium and so everyone you know there's your guys are doing amazing you know journalism and and writing about yourselves and i never write about myself and i'm always several layers removed um, so, you know, I, I do feel like I'm an outsider, even within the journalism, when I was, I've been a newspaper uh, cartoonist, and, um, you know, I'm not part of a newsroom. Um, when I, w I was in the Washington Post for about 10 years, I was in the newsroom, I think, twice. You know, I just like to come meet the editor and, and get introduced around, but, you know, I'm drawing these comics every week for 10 years. I'm not even part of the newsroom. I'm literally in my apartment, in a room, drawing comics apart from, you know, the rest of the world. I engage in the world separately, um, but my cartooning, I feel like, is just uh, is a total total outsider. Sophia? Um, yeah, I, I thought about this also a lot in the process of making the book because drawing, as I'm sure many of you in here relate to, it's, it, it demands a remove, right? Like, you have to, to draw a thing, you can't be part of the thing fully. And so I spent a lot of time like at these protests with the sketchbook, right? Like, and there were real moments and, and this kind of emotional arc for me to some extent is in the book about how much I feel a part of the organizing group, like the governmental group, but also just kind of the space of the people here. And I did feel this obligation throughout the course of the project to maintain some sort of line because I wanted it to be independent material. And it was hard to do because I believed in the project of uh, this office and of the organizers. And there were real times when it felt just stupid <laughs> to be like at a march and observing it rather than being a part of it. Um, but I also think, you know, it's all about where you draw the line, right, of inside and outside. And we all have circles we feel inside of and circles we feel outside of. And those are informative and useful. It, in different moments, right? You want to be an outsider sometimes. You want that remove. It's really valuable to have perspective. And what you gain from being inside of something is also, you know, warmth and community. This is also a big part of this book, is sort of finding community and the idea that politics is something distant and scary and opaque um, that, like, only men in business suits in DC are inside of was 
kind of the whole impetus of making this book because it just didn't feel accurate to me. It felt like Warren said that we all are affected by politics and so why does it feel like this black box if these things are actually so close to me, they're in my home, they're affecting my body, right? Um, so I feel really lucky that I found a group of people whose whole politics revolve around complete transparency and sharing of information and this belief that it not just can be but like must be a group project um, because it, it really, it changed my perspective so much on, on politics and how close it is and whether I'm inside of it. So I want to kind of turn the conversation just, just a little bit and ask something that's almost process oriented. So all of you work in, uh, Andy, I've seen, I have a lot of your single panel work and you've also done narrative work and everybody has done stuff in between except for you. <laughs> I don't remember you ever doing, let's say, single panel or long form stuff. So my, my question is, is, one, when do you know which formats to use and then because you're not familiar with, let's say, doing long form stuff like what Sophia has done, is there anything you shy away from because like, wow, you know, I don't know how I can properly represent that given the set of tools that, that I have to go ahead and comment on whatever the topic may be, mm -hmm. right? So I just, I just want to see, you know, wait, how do you make that decision? Where do you go? Why don't we start yeah, with? I, well, it's true. I, I don't, haven't done much long form. My single panels are like the Richard Scarry thing that I just showed, which is a single panel, but it's not a single panel it's not a single cartoon, panel, right? right yes. The way the way you, the way you're referring to it, um, but I still feel as though every week I have that rectangle to fill, and I fill it, you know, in wildly different ways. Um, you can talk about the number of panels; it can be uh, one, it could be sixteen, um, uh, it could be, you know, conceptual. Um, Your super fun pack comics, right? Then okay. there's lots of little comics in there. So there's there's. Uh, what I set out to do with my comic strip is to make it as free form as possible so that I can do, I could have, um, you know, a totally open playground to do whatever I want. So, you know, if something happens that I want to comment on, well, for example, that school, school shooting, I, th I think of, you know, various ways that I can express that. You know, should this be a story? Should this be um, one of my existing characters? Um, and, uh, you know, it's, and then you, it's eventually you come up with that aha moment when, like, Oh, this is the way I want to do it. This well, is. Do you, do you ever it. find yourself confined by just that? You know, because you're on one page. Okay, that's it. You've got one page. Souls in front of you. Right, right. Do you ever feel where it's like, oh my God, whatever that topic may be, that you're too confined and you can't attack it? Uh, no, I feel as though through that okay. one rectangle, I can do whatever I want. I've done multi-part episodes too, where I do like a, a to be continued. Um, I don't do that as much as I used to, but. I feel like um, that's my constraint. That's like the, uh, you know, in poetry you have these constraints. Um, right. And then within that, you work within that. And that's, um, you know, I've, now I'm in this groove after all these decades of I know what, I know what my limits are. Now let's, let's play with them. Let's, uh, I got to fill this rectangle. Now let's figure out. And, you know, it's a puzzle, you know, I, yeah. to each time to figure out a way to effectively say what I want to say and be entertaining and be funny and, uh, uh, and you know, and say something just just with that 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 box. Right. Yeah. Um, Sophia, you work in now. You've worked in two really radically different. Yeah. Okay, so you've gone from the single panel all the way up to this multi-page, very dense graphic novel in terms of dialogue, in terms of carrying forward um, themes, and all of those kinds of intricacies that you get into. Where, where do you see yourself in terms of going forward? in terms of the formats and the thing, kind of things you want to do and the kind of comments you want to go ahead and make? Yeah, I don't know, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna go have an existential crisis now. Um, this is a book because it felt like it needed to be a book and that's because I did not feel like I could spend a short amount of time with these people and have anything to say about it. Mm -hmm. So for me, just knowing my own sort of personality I needed it to be a longer time frame, and to me that just suited a book format far more than other kinds of media. And I actually had, at the very early stages of this, I kind of cold call. I didn't have an agent or anything, so I cold called a bunch of agents through email. And this woman I really admire responded, 
And I, she, at one point she was like, where did you get my email? Like she thought it didn't exist. So she thought I had been referred and I just found it on the internet. Um, but she was like, I think this should be a serialized strip in like a newspaper or something. This is better suited to that. And I was really upset about it because I felt like it needed to be a book. And here was this person I so admired telling me something else. Um, and I think it would have been a very different project, right? Like I really needed time to process and to step back and, and create like a body that has some emotional arc that I would have lost with the strip. Um, as far as what to do next, I don't know. I mean, I comics are so cool because you can just kind of do whatever. I think uh, the constraint aspect that you're mentioning is so vital to a creative project because just looking at like the wild, wide open terrain of what you like, could <laughs> do is is overwhelming. Um, I like I like telling longer stories. I also really like. I think maybe we all relate to this. It's, I think it's really vital for me to have like a bunch of different kinds of projects to jump back and forth between to kind of just shake out the dust. So I have an advice column that's illustrated that I do that's like pretty silly but kind of earnest. And um, I really love doing that because it lets me like in real time directly respond to other people. Um, so I feel excited about jumping around. So we'll see. I'd, I'd, I'd like to know oh, go ahead. The, that agent uh, who wanted you to serialize this in the newspapers. What what newspaper was she referring <laughs> to? Uh, that, that doesn't exist anymore. Know, Wrap it around a brick and throw it off the table. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was an abstract. <laughs> right. Concept. It had to be, yes. <laughs> yeah, new, newspapers and comics don't really get along these days. Not anymore. Okay. No, no. Un unless you're a Peanuts reprint from the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> and I um, wish I would. Allie? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, to piggyback on what you both have said, I, well, what you said, Sophia, of like, I don't know, that's a huge question. That's definitely been something that I've been grappling with because like I've done a lot of work. I did single panels. I did single panels for the Boston Globe for a while, S slightly longer, but still short form comics in the nib. And then now like 250 page graphic novels all in the nonfiction genre. So now that I've like dipped my toes in, I'm trying to figure out like, well, if I do have a story, if I have a narrative, just like the seed of an idea, which one of these does it like fit into best? And I think to a certain extent, you can make it work in all the different formats. It's just um, like the difference of how you literally craft the comics. But I, I think something that I personally want to explore more is taking like these bigger, political or current event ideas, whatever the case may be, and interweaving them into fiction stories a little bit more so that it, like, especially for longer form work, I think is something that I want to explore that like, I did the 250 page graphic novels in nonfiction topics and they work and they're informative and they're educational and I'm glad that I did them. But I think that it's, it's bulky. They're very heavy books. And they're, that's good for a certain context, but I want to explore how to get people into these topics, but without it feeling like I'm being didactic or preachy or like force feeding them the topic. I want there to be a narrative. And then these ideas are just kind of like woven into it a little bit more, not in a heavy handed way, not in a very direct kind of way, but it's just getting people to think about the topics a little bit more than me feeding them the information. So I think in terms of long form, that's personally, I'm not saying that like it doesn't work, but that's something that I in my own work want to start exploring a little bit Great. more. Andy? Um, so form, I mean, I spent, a lot of my early career working as a freelancer, a journalist basically. Um, and so I learned very quickly that a lot of that kind of depends on who's buying it. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes you can sell something long, sometimes you can sell something short. Um, and I just kind of have like a pitch bag that's bubbling around. As I've gotten older and um, got a bag bubbling is like a really bad mixed <laughs> metaphor. But, I like it. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I haven't been freelancing as much because um, I've been working on books more. And with that, I mean, I've, one of my books is one long narrative and all the other ones are kind of short vignettes. Um, and so I've worked in both. Um, the long continuous narrative is 
for sure harder. I mean, being able to write like little pocket histories is almost like a cheat hack of um, <laughs> mixing up short form and long form. Um, but I love both short form and long form. Um, I don't think I would kind of choose to pick one over the other. You can really do different things in them, but treat the same topics and right. actually like achieve similar results. You just have to use them differently. And, and you raise an interesting point about you know, who you're going to sell to. So I want to ask everybody here, and one of the things that's happened, and everyone, I, I, I don't know how aware people are in the audience, but basically the number of political cartoonists on the staff of newspapers has dropped to, what, below 50 now or something I like don't that? even know. Yeah, just yeah. a few dozen. Right. Yeah, there's just a couple of dozen left where at one point, even 25 years ago when you included the old weekly world, oh, there were yeah. 150, 200 easily political cartoonists working at the time. So the, the, the question is, is, you know, you're doing all this political and social commentary. How the hell are you making a living? Okay. <laughs> How is this <laughs> happening? All right. <laughs> So we'll, we'll, we'll start with Allie first on this one. Okay, well, we were just talking about this before we came in. A lot of us up here teach also. <laughs> um, so don't quit your day job yeah. is one of the... Well, yeah. no, we that's... Comics. Yeah, <laughs> we do teach comics. Yeah, it's all, it's all related. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, it kind of goes back to we were saying, I think, Ruben, you said, like, I'm not changing anybody's mind with these anymore. <laughs> so I think it's a matter of, yeah, kind of like knowing what audience you want to write to and create for and who you're trying to talk to. It's, there's a lot, I, I, after, I mean, like, I hate to keep going back to like 2016, 2017, but after that, I do think that there has been this kind of like resurgence of interest in topics that are nonfiction and politically infused, um, that I think that you definitely saw a lot more nonfiction stuff out there and there's, there isn't, there's a want for it. It is out there. A lot of publishers are looking for work in that field. So I don't think it's a quit, like don't quit your day job kind of thing. I think it's just a matter of figuring out what stories now, because there is a little bit of saturation of it, what stories still need to be told and in what format. Does it need yeah. to be the short form, long form, whatever the case may be? What's going to reach the people who need to hear this the most? Um, and I think there, there are publishers out there who are doing it. Again, the single panels the in newspapers, like, yeah, yeah the nib. The <laughs> nib is definitely, like, at the forefront of all this, yeah. Um, and I think, like, if you look at the history of, like, single panel, like, editorial cartoons, like, they were in newspapers back in the day for people who, like, didn't know how to read, and that was a way to, like, get political information across. And it doesn't really work the same way anymore. So the purpose of those, it's it's different now, and that's why I think yeah. you don't quite see it as much. And it's a little bit preaching to the choir and whatnot. That's that's a whole different topic. Um, but it's it's out there. There's definitely a need for it. There's definitely one for it now. It's just a matter of like, what are the unique stories that we still need to hear? Yeah. And that's what a publisher is going to be looking for, I think. Andy. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that it's generally, as a rule, easier to sell. Uh, short form nonfiction than it is to sell short form fiction. Uh, but it's just more like if you treat yourself as a journalist and think about what your specialties are and what you can write on, whether it's your own community or something you're interested in, um, you can sell those stories. Um, I've done stuff for Popular Science, I've done stuff for Slate, I've done stuff oh. for American Public Media. I mean, the New York Times puts out comics now. Like every Everywhere puts out comics because like Joe Sacco happened and we're done with <laughs> right. it. We don't have to prove ourselves anymore. Um, and it, that's a really nice thing. And it, it's a similar dynamic to writing actually, where like it's easier to make a living as an essayist than a journalist than maybe you know like sending out stories to see if they get picked up by the Sci-Fi Monthlies. Um, there's just more of a paying audience out there. That said, it can be harder to like piece that together into you know the overarching career. But there's money out there. Um, yeah, Sophia, so I wanted to ask you because the, the New Yorker, I mean, the New Yorker is, it's prestigious and they pay pretty well for the single panel cartoons when you can get them in. I want to clarify that. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of, uh, you know, um, in, in the middle here. So I wanted to find out where your head's at in terms of, well, what do you... Like how, to, how to make a living? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> in comics? Are we talking about the same thing? Um, I think one of the things I love about comics is that you don't need to make a living off of it to be completely respected in this field. Like, there are a lot of us who just know that that's not the way to buy a house. Like, <laughs> um, and that if you're doing that work around the sides, I just think this is a community that really understands that and that the ego doesn't have to be part of that. Just before I say anything else, 
Um, I do think personally the New Yorker like is a is a nice label to put on things that's helped me open other doors. Um, like I don't know that I would have been able to sell this book without being able to you know prove my legitimacy in some way through that. Um, and then, I mean, I just to be honest about what I do, I animate also. So a lot of my like client work is animation, um, which I find a little bit easier to make like living wages off of than yeah. selling cartoons, even if they're. You know, the, car the New Yorker does sell well per cartoon, but a lot of that is on spec. It's not very reliable. You don't know that you're gonna sell a cartoon or not. Um, so it's illustration and the animation client work that kind of pays the bills <laughs> well, and, steadily. And, and one comment on animation work, it is unbelievable there must be two, three, four dozen people that have been at SPX that are now working at animation studios out in California. Um, Pixar, Nickelodeon, uh, all of them, Comic ne um, uh, Cartoon Network, all of them have that. I don't want to leave you out. So, <laughs> Well, I think my experience maybe touches most directly to what you were talking about, which is the political cartooning and newspaper cartooning. And so when I started, my goal was to be a newspaper cartoonist, and uh, uh, I built up in the alternative news weeklies. Um, and uh, I was in the Washington Post for 10 years, right, the Village Voice. Uh, well, um, at your height, how many alt weeklies were you uh, like, in? Do you remember? Well, I was in about 150 newspapers at my height. And I built this up, this career, like, wow, I'm actually doing it. And then all of a sudden, it began going down as print newspapers began cutting back in comics, going out of business, changing their schedule. You know, I got, I got from alternative weeklies to daily newspapers, and everything was going great. And then that changed. and. Um, I had to figure out how it changed because of the web, and I had to figure out how to make the web work for me because I did have a good web client at the time that this all happened, Salon.com, which was like one of the biggest uh, web magazines. So how did I? How can I make those eyeballs turn into re replace that that income? And um, you know, it took me too long to figure it out, but I eventually did, and it's it's a combination of things, but basically. Um, I have a subscription service, so people who like my comic uh, pay for to, to get it a day before it's published anywhere else. Um, and I, I just I keep saying this because I love this story. The day that I launched that, and I was worried like what would happen with this. The day I launched it, that subscription service became the single biggest uh, revenue service, including including you. Uh, the single biggest revenue source that I had ever had. And, um, and I, I want to point one thing out. He's one of the first ones to do this. So before, well yeah. before Patreon came along, oh, yeah. you put out the Hive. I had been, to figure out how to, how to, how to do, do it that. logistically. And, and so, and how long ago did you launch the Hive? 2012. Right, oh, so, so and been. this is before Patreon came along. So that business model, I think you should sue them. It is. Okay. <laughs> well, it was a very unusual thing to ask readers directly. You know, I, and I wanted to provide right. a service. It wasn't just like, please pay me money. I'm gonna give you the comic and commentary uh, and you know pictures of my process, whatever I can think of to put in there, uh, and I gave you get it a day early before it go, goes anywhere else. Right. And um, and now you know I'm in almost no newspapers. It's very few. I'm on, I'm doing well on the web, including the Nib is fantastic, but you know Boing Boing and Daily Coast and Go Comics. But I'm doing better now than I was when I was in 150 newspapers, including yeah. the, the Washington Post and you know all the and the you know. Atlanta Constitution Journal. And, and after you did yours, um, Tom Tomorrow did the same thing, Jen Sorensen, That's Keith That's not a Knight. coincidence. He called me up and Right, yes, <laughs> I remember, I remember. So and how did you do that? <laughs> well, ex and, yeah. and like I said, this is well before Patreon came along. Right, right. right. So we're, we're at the end of the time. I did want to say one thing. So we've, everyone here, except for Sophia, because she hasn't worked with them, has done something with the nib, including yours truly. So they're at table L9, so go pick up you know, some of their magazines. Uh, and read stuff from actually pretty much everybody here. Yep. Uh, so I advocate that. And so I want to thank everybody very much. I'm sorry we ran out of time in terms of questions, but I, I got into engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Warren.